Welcome back to the channel guys, where I hope to regale to you about a certain series I have had the pleasure of playing through recently. This series gave me so much during a time when I was not at my best, and I'm confident it can do the same for others who are looking for something memorable. So come on in, and you'll see what I'm talking about. It's just upstairs. Here we are, make yourself at home. I hope that seat's uh, comfortable for you. Now, normally, you know that I cover JRPGs on this channel, whether they be traditional, action-based, or strategic. But I also do like to cover games that, while not JRPG specifically, they have RPG elements within them. But when I play these games, I also ask myself, is it a game or a series that JRPG fans can enjoy? So with that in mind, I want to ask you, have you ever heard of Uta Wanedu Mono? Developed by Aquaplus, Uta Wareru Mono is a series that has been around for a fair length of time, beginning back in 2002 as an adult visual novel for Japan. Due to the first title's commercial success, with the game sitting at the top of sales charts for Bishojo visual novels at the time, it eventually would take on the mantle of a multimedia franchise, spawning manga, anime, and drama CDs. Eventually, the first game, commonly known as Prelude to the Fallen, would be followed by a duo that would encapsulate a complete trilogy, with Mask of Deception releasing in 2015 and Mask of Truth following a year later. All of these were eventually ported and made available on the PC via Steam come 2021. Unfortunately, Mask of Deception and Mask of Truth that were also made available on PS Vita, PS3 and PS4 were delisted from the store in January 2021 due to the expiration of Atlas's licensing rights. As of the time of recording, they have yet to return, meaning that the best way to play all of them would be on the aforementioned PC. It is also worth mentioning that there are two Muso spin-off titles called Zan 1 and 2 which follow the events of Mask of Deception and Mask of Truth respectively but are more abridged versions of those narratives despite having some exclusive scenes and fully realised 3D models for both story sequences and combat. And for that reason, this video will not focus on the Muso titles and instead focus fully on the mainline series, which are mostly hybrid visual novels come strategy RPGs. And with that brief rundown out of the way, it is my distinct pleasure to introduce you to the world of Uta Wareru Mono. Now the first thing you'll want to know is where to begin. The typical order begins with Prelude to the Fallen, followed by Mask of Deception, and finally Mask of Truth. However, there is also a fourth game that was released very recently that acts as a prequel to the events of the two Mask titles, but we'll be talking about that one later on. For now, we start right at the beginning, the Prelude if you will. Utawareru Mono is set in a world reminiscent of feudal era Japan, a land of warring factions, fantastical creatures, and wondrous marvels, initially focusing on an amnesiac protagonist called Hakuolo. From here, the gameplay takes on a roughly 70-30 split with the bulk involving reading, as typical of visual novels, and strategic gameplay making up the remainder. So let's start with the combat first. The gameplay in the original trilogy is fairly self-explanatory, with battles taking place on a tactical grid. Players will have a choice of who they choose to use before the battle begins, and they will be able to choose where they want to place them on said map as well. The base of the gameplay is fairly similar between each of the titles, though there is no doubt that Prelude is the simplest of that group, drawing more in design from its original release despite sporting a 3D style akin to the two Mask games. In Prelude, most characters have one action that they can use which proceeds in a chain. These range from melee attacks to ranged attacks and healing. During this chain, a ring will close inwards, prompting the player to press at the correct time, similar to the system from Lost Odyssey. If you press at the right time you continue the chain but also add zeal to a gauge specific to each character. Once the gauge is full, the characters can access their final strike if they have unlocked the move. However, using this ability will end the overzeal state, so there is a small degree of strategy there in terms of choosing when to use it. Combo abilities are also available between certain characters that offer debuffs and heavier damage in exchange for a zeal cost, which are at least pleasing on the eye. It becomes apparent quite quickly though that Prelude isn't the most challenging title. Adding fuel to that argument is that there is no permadeath in the game, plus there is a rewind option available if you happen to mess up, something that carries over to the two sequels. The only real element of strategy and customization for Prelude comes in how you position your character. Attack from the back or side and you deal more damage, which is really the only notable edge that the first game has over its successors. After battle, bonus XP is awarded to the participating characters and they are also awarded battle points or BP which can be allocated to any stat the player chooses. 
In here, there is also a simple equipment management system where one slot represents your equipment and the other two are for consumables. And this BP system, while it is a pretty cool idea, ultimately makes min-maxing very easy. You see, there is also an option to revisit previous missions, but the enemies in said missions remain at the same levels they were from that point in the story. Despite that, they yield the same amount of battle points. So in other words, you can go back to a very early mission in the game when you get to, say, the halfway point of the story, find one with a very easy objective and just spam it to grind up battle points. It makes the rest of the game trivial, and I definitely did not abuse this. Thankfully, Mask of Deception and Truth do freshen up the gameplay a fair amount, providing more options to the player and presenting more of a challenge. Equipment management is still available, but instead changes up standard equipment to codexes. They offer not only flat stat increases, but also defensive maneuvers that operate similar to attacks. The defensive abilities are a distinct addition to the two Mask games, allowing players to guard against certain abilities abilities or even counter-attack. There is also a much wider array of moves available, with each character having an average of three to choose from as long as they are within range of the target. The overzeal mechanic was also changed slightly as well, as characters get an extra turn when entering said mode, and a unique buff based on their elemental affinity. Sigils are also introduced for the first time, and they basically create zones on the field that can yield different effects like lower damage or even heal over time. The standard ring system is also expanded with the addition of hold actions to too, so there's a bit more variety to be had. However, even with these additions, it would be a bold statement to say this system is anything more than adequate. It's not the deepest strategic gameplay you're ever going to see, especially for those who enjoy tactical games on the regular. The simple truth is that the gameplay takes second fiddle in the majority, but it's still enjoyable in how it ties into the story on frequent occasions. Battles feel dynamic in that there's unique dialogue occurring in every fight, plus the way some battles play out can straight up change depending on how you go about it. The outcome remains the same, but a second phase may pop up depending on who you kill first, for example, so there's a degree of choice there, and dare I say it, maybe a little bit of replayability as well. It's a suitable enough battle system that does what it needs to do, and if anything, might be more appealing to those who aren't too enamoured with tactical games, as the pace of the battles is generally a lot quicker owing to the simpler equipment management. So yeah, the tactical gameplay isn't the most inspired, it does what it needs to do though. But now that we've covered the 30, let's go over the 70, that being the story and characters, the main question being, do they deliver? Well, put it this way, if they didn't, this video wouldn't exist. So, how do they actually do that? While the narrative is no doubt the greatest strength of Utawara du Mono, it also presents its biggest challenge. Visual novels live and die by their stories. For every opus Echo of Star Song, there exists ten others that waste away on an aspiring developer's shelf, never to be seen again. In the case of Opus though, or indeed Aegis Rim, those are shorter adventures. While memorable and excellent in their own rights, they're not what you'd consider to be a grand epic. Utawara du Mono, on the other hand, is a series with over 100 hours of story. It presents a notable high risk reward scenario. The reward is that people remember the journey long after it finishes, reminiscing on the events and the characters with an almost familial melancholy. The risk, however, comes in keeping players engaged so that they can see that reward in its entirety. That's the balance that the games have to strike. Now, navigation through this story doesn't progress like a typical visual novel in that you make a choice and you go down different routes and potentially get a bad ending. Rather, the ending is set in stone, but you make a choice on where you go to next, which feeds into the overall pace of the game. And I can already tell that there are many players, past, present and future, who, after engaging with this style of visual novel, will abandon Prelude within 5-10 to 10 hours, citing that it is poorly paced. Of course, though, this is subjective and it all comes down to personal taste, but I will draw on my favourite JRPG series and trails and use that as a basis to advocate that Utawaru Mono is not poorly paced, it's simply paced slowly. Regardless of how fast it progresses, events are still occurring, the narrative is pushing on and plot points are opening up. But it takes its time to deliver on those grand reveals which are definitely worth it when considering all the build up that goes into them. In fact, I would argue that the pacing is just right. Considering the size of the world and multitude of concepts introduced, ample time needs to be given to each of them so that when they are inevitably brought up further down the line, you're able to draw on that memory easily rather than scrambling around figuring out what's going on. If you do get lost though, a glossary is available that automatically updates at certain junctures. Though I would have liked this to be in numbered steps rather than in one big paragraph, as even though it does mark when new information is available, you still need to find that information within the block of text. Nevertheless, the glossary is very important to supplement the world building 
coming on offer here, as you will likely need to remind yourself of the wide array of terminology, some of which has literally been taken from Japanese and remained as such in the English localization. Case in point, the title of the series itself. But because the trilogy took so much care in how it introduced and fleshed out its concepts, it provided a minor yet undoubtedly consistent feeling of building on a base that kept me so enthralled. Despite its slower pacing, Utawaru no Mono kept me hooked very easily, and I realised quite quickly that it accomplished this via a two-pronged method. On one side, there are these slice-of-life moments, which provide a break from the more heavy narrative segments. In the majority, they're just humorous events that allow us to see our characters in another light, but they also act as precursors at times for key events. This harmony between humour and the main narrative ensures that the story beats don't feel contrived since you can draw on these instances when you see the developments occur. It's really good how the games can take these seemingly carefree moments but apply them seamlessly to the serious events that eventually follow. On the other side, the advantage advancement of the main story is often tied in some way to the characters. A small slice of the story is given in each arc that contributes to the eventual climax, but its justification for starting these arcs is sourced from the characters themselves, so there is justification to see it through. It not only pushes the narrative along in a meaningful manner, but it also puts the spotlight on each member and adds meat to their own personal story, ensuring that the player can more easily relate to each individual. And this method, in combination with the slice of life moments, elevates the characters to a very high quality, and for me personally, I'd say character development in Utawari no Mono is among some of the best I've ever seen. But characters are only one part of the marvel that is Utawari no Mono's story. There's just so many other elements, so many little cogs that make up this well-oiled machine. First of all, the artwork is wonderful, especially the CG pieces that you get to view every so often. I will admit that it is a little repetitive in terms of the backgrounds used, especially in Prelude to the Fallen, and I do admit I have a personal preference for the style from the two Mask games, but there's no doubt that the illustration works in tandem with everything else presented. It also helps that the voice acting is strong throughout too. There's unfortunately no English dub for these games, but the Japanese voice actors own their roles, as they normally do. <laughs> ま、the OST is also very strong and contributes positively to the multitude of scenes shown. Whether the situation calls for a sense of foreboding, unbridled joy or triumph, there is pretty much always a song that matches the occasion. I've actually been using a few of these songs during this video, so you can get an idea of what to expect should you try it out yourself. And finally, I have to highlight the quality of the writing. Unlike a typical gaming experience, a visual novel or hybrid one like this has to convey a scene via a limited number of graphics, those being predominantly backgrounds and the character expressions in still frames for the most part. As a result, the onus is put heavily on the writing to allow a player to visualise everything within their head, and it's a testament to said writing that I never lost track of what was happening. I was always able to expand upon the base that the visual showed me to fully realise what was occurring, getting fully absorbed by the scenes themselves. I could both read and comprehend the mannerisms, the tension, and it allowed the scenes to hit in the intended manner. And when it all comes together, well, it's not often that I am floored by a story like I was with this series. These games are not afraid to dole out some heavy punches at times, and it's just made ever more impactful when you've seen it build up over many hours. The range of emotion that I went through while playing these games, especially as I got to the end of Mask of Truth, rarely gets replicated. I can count on one hand the games that have hit me like Utawaru no Mono did. It is a special story, well deserving of the praise that is levied at it. But wait, I did say there was one more game in this saga, a game that released very recently in fact back in 2022. If you find yourself enamoured with the world, the characters and the mythos of Utawaru no Mono and its original trilogy, then you will also want to play Monochromobius Rights and Wrongs Forgotten.
Monochrome Mobius was announced back in November 2021 and later stated that it would release worldwide as Rights and Wrongs Forgotten for PlayStation 4, 5 and PC. It acts as a prequel to the events of Mask of Deception and Mask of Truth, though it is my belief that this is better served as a title for those who are already enamoured with the world of Utawaru Mono, rather than a game you should play as a newcomer. And the main reason for that? Well, it's rough around the edges. It's by no means a bad game, but it's quite clear that Aqua Plus aren't well versed in genres outside of visual novels, at least not for the time being. You'll notice quickly that Monochrome Mobius is a radical shift from the original trilogy, as it plays out like a typical JRPG. And though the effort to freshen up the series is commendable, it has some real glaring faults. When I first purchased it, the game was plagued with odd design choices like the inability to save wherever and whenever you want, and the NPCs literally looked like they were stuck in the alpha phase of development. <laughs> and clearly I wasn't the only one who had issue here as both were addressed in a 7GB patch shortly after the game released. For reference, the game itself is pretty hefty too, at around 35 gigs. This is for the PC version by the way. However, even in the present day, it's still stricken with a strangely inconsistent camera, stiff character models that look like they belong in the PS3 era, oddly sharp jump cuts between scenes, noticeable screen tearing on the PC version, and transitions are a bit, well, janky. As for the game itself though, it proceeds in a manner that JRPG fans will find familiar. You take control of a team and proceed through a linear story, participating in quests, exploring a semi-open world, and taking part in turn-based combat. Combat itself sees a maximum of four characters on the front line, each with their own abilities. Turn order is now decided by a three-layered ring system on the top left. The higher the speed of the character, the faster they progress around the ring. There is also the ability to push enemies back on the ring to get extra turns in. The overseal state also returned, but they once again have added function as a way to ascend to higher tiers on the action ring. The closer you get to the center of the ring, the more frequently your turn shows up. You'll also have your standard fare and skill usage that also allows the ability to buff and debuff with each character taking on a specific role, plus the game offers a backup member later on. Now it sounds alright, and to be honest it is a solid enough battle system, but it does feel a little outdated for the time. For example, as you get to the higher levels your skill sets become more arduous to manage. I would have preferred if the ranked up ability simply replaced the old ones, but I appreciate that each rank has different effects, so it's a nice idea. One thing I will say about Monochrome Mobius though in terms of its combat is that it punishes you hard if you're not at the right level, and it's got no issue pushing you into these battles when you're unprepared either. There were several times where I got stomped simply because I didn't grind it out enough. <laughs> Now that's not saying the game is difficult though. In fact, it's very easy to overlevel in Monochrome Mobius. You see, when you're moving about in the world, you have a preemptive attack that you can use to gain an advantage in combat. However, if you are a sufficiently higher level than the monster you hit, you kill them instantly, with a couple of exceptions. Killing them this way yields the same rewards you would have received if you killed them in the traditional manner. So in other words, you can go around some of the later areas, preemptive strike away for like 30 minutes, and and come back to the main story jacked up beyond all recognition. And I definitely did not abuse this. So yeah, it's got solid bones, but it's certainly not the deepest turn-based system you'll ever see, just like it was with the original trilogy and its strategic-based gameplay. But again, just like that trilogy, this gameplay does what it needs to do. Exploration, on the other hand, which of course is a new addition to Monochrome Mobius, is okay. The world has been well realised and it's a great feeling to see the world of Utawaru Mono brought to life, not to mention there are certain key areas in the game that you'll recognise from the trilogy, and it does give you that giddy feeling when you see it in a fully rendered world. Though not truly open world, there's plenty to find in terms of treasures and collectibles that you can later use to upgrade certain facilities as well. Another important aspect of the game, as ensuring your equipment is up to par, becomes another key part of progression. The development team have done a pretty good job on this front though. But as it was before, the real star of the show in Monochrome Mobius is once again its story, a narrative that acts as a welcome supplement in many respects to the original trilogy, while also bringing in its own additions to the mythos. Now despite being a prequel to the events of Deception and Truth, it's my personal recommendation to play this after the original trilogy, and there are a couple of reasons for this. Initially, this game spoils quite a few events from the main trilogy, and it does it quite early on too. Of course, you'll also be spoiled on some events in this game if you play the trilogy, 
trilogy first, but I feel on balance, in terms of plot significance, Monochrome Mobius spoils the more impactful moments from the series as a whole. Aqua Plus, I think, were aware that this game was going to draw in those who had already played the main trilogy, and as such, they've weaved the story in a way that will please those who have played those games first. The story feels fulfilling because it expands on many of the points that weren't given too much of a focus in the trilogy, while also expanding on backstories of characters who weren't at the forefront in those games but still had important roles. It is once again quite a slow adventure in terms of pacing, but eventually you'll start seeing how it all connects, and I derived a lot of satisfaction from seeing these characters who are at the end of their personal arcs come the two Mask games, given fully realised origin stories of their own. It's a very interesting method of storytelling in that me as the player already knew the end goal, I already knew the relationships of these characters in the main games, but I never knew how that happened. Seeing those relationships grow and eventually become what they did in the two Mask games was a joy to witness firsthand. The character development was once again on point. But not only that, the humorous side of the storytelling also returns here, and much of that humour is well realised if you've played the original trilogy. There's a fair amount of tongue-in-cheek moments spread throughout that gave me a good chuckle on frequent occasions, and it helps that the actual scenes themselves, while they weren't technical marvels, were just really fun to watch. <laughs> Now, while the game does take on many new elements, it also makes the wise decision to maintain characteristics of its visual novel forebears, sporting recognisable backgrounds, and at times, simply using character sprites to deliver dialogue at certain points along with the sprinkling of CG artwork in between. This may appear lazy in any other game, but in Monochrome Mobius, I justify this as consistency in design. There's a familiarity there which can be oh so important for a long-running story like this, demonstrating that the developers have not abandoned the series' roots. The art direction also changed once again through the choice of Aqua Plus as they wanted to make it look like a brand new work separated from the main trilogy still looks really good. It fulfills its main goal in that even though it's attempting to present younger versions of already established characters, it still maintains the recognisable traits of the cast from those games, meaning the relatability is still there. And I'd feel wrong to at least not give mention to the OST once again because it's fantastic. This was actually noted as a particular point of importance for producer Naoya Shimakawa with over 100 tracks making up its OST and environmental scores. They did a really good job here, and dare I say it, I think this has the best collection of songs out of the entirety of the series, but that's just me. In short, due to all of these cogs working together in harmony once again, the story delivers on all the facets that made the original strong, in that it had a good balance of humour, but also knew when to knuckle down for the serious moments. Monochrome Mobius may not be the perfect JRPG in a bubble, but for Uta Wairu Mono, it adds positively to the already rich and deep lore of the series. Series. And I'm confident that even now, after playing all the games, that this story has yet to finish. And thus we come to the end of the video, which I hope has given you a brief yet shining light on this underappreciated gem of a series. I mean this wholeheartedly, that if you are a JRPG fan who places a heavy importance on story and that it's the element you derive the most enjoyment from, or for instance you are a Trails fan like me and are looking for something similar in scope, I am confident, no no, extremely confident, that you will find something special and memorable in the world of Uta Wadudu Mono. Thank you for watching this video, if you liked it please like and subscribe for more JRPG content and consider joining my Patreon if you're interested. Peace!